let's stay with matters legal. In June last year, a legal services watchdog was officially launched. Now, this past week, the first legal ombudsman, retired judge Siraj Desai, released his very first report. He's flagged concerns about declining ethics in the profession, and here to tell us all about it, he's in studio. Judge, thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you very much for having me on. And, you know, it's interesting listening to Slee's report on Tabo Besta. We know that two of the lawyers acting for Tabo Besta themselves are facing charges, one of fraud and the other, I think, of, of rape or some sort of grievous assault. They have, I understand, recused themselves not because of these issues, for other reasons. But what does it say? That's quite brazen uh, uh, that they do so publicly and openly, knowing full well they're facing serious criminal charges. Uh, I'm very concerned about that. Because, you know, ethics has been, or is, has been in the, in the public light for a number of years now. It started with the, well, it started in more recent times with the Zondo Commission, where the attorneys and advocates who appeared in that period, in that era, this country history was savaged by the Zondo Commission. Then, not so long ago, we had the attorneys in the RAF matter, where the attorneys the got, road well, got double payments. Mm. And they didn't return the money until they were asked to do so. And some haven't returned the payments yet. And now we have this unfortunate saga in that trial where two, where two of the attorneys themselves are facing serious charges. There seems to be a lack of decorum mm. in what attorneys are doing. Uh, they seem to be ignoring the ethical values which I grew up as an attorney upholding. Mm. And it, it's concerning that it's happening now with increasing, uh, increasing amount of time but also increasing intensity. The offences are so brazen that it makes one, an old lawyer like me, cringe. Mm. And, and interestingly, in the, in the Besta case, um, we had this report last week, legally they don't have to step aside until the end of the trial if they're found guilty. But these are serious charges yes. facing these two people. I mean, it's about doing the right thing. It's not just about what the law say, surely. It's not a question of simply that. It's the question where we, as the guardians of a profession, fail. I think the LPC should act expeditiously in matches such as this. And Is that, if complaints that's the legal do come, practice the, council. Yeah, yeah, the legal practice council. Sorry, the legal practice council should act expeditiously in such matters and ask the suspension of these attorneys pending the finalisation of the trials. I mean, there's a presumption of innocence, yes, but that's only until the conclusion of the trial. But in the interim, one can't have people facing many crimes of fraud, serious fraud, walking around and practicing as attorneys. That's not acceptable. I think uh, society must take a deeper look at what is happening. And we as those, the parts of the profession we have to deal with this, must deal with this. Mm. I'm just in my office now for the last two years. We started off with virtually nothing. We were funded by the Department of Justice. We now have five attorneys on our staff, and we have offices only in Cape Town and in Pretoria. So there's a lot of work to be done. And many of these incidents are occurring in other parts of the country as well. well in you, flagged other parts of Natal a, you flagged KwaZulu-Natal as a particular concern. Yes, uh, that's Tell us why. Yeah, they, they most, many of the complaints come from that part of the world, and we don't have an office there. As soon as we get sufficient funding, we will... Uh, open an office in KZN somewhere, mm. either Durban or Peter Maritzburg. We're working on that. And this explain to those that our funding works. Funding comes to us from the Department of Justice presently. But the Act contemplates an independent body. So eventually the money will come from the other, from the ministry, finance ministry. So we got a year to get that going. So once that go gets going, we can see how we can, how we can best use our resources throughout the country. So tell us a little bit more about what you do, because you mentioned the legal practice uh, council, that that looks after the lawyers, keeps an eye on the lawyers, etc. Am I right that you're there for the ordinary citizen who feels they've been hard done by, by a lawyer? Is that what yeah, you do? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> we have two primary objectives. The first is to protect the public interest to protect and advance the public interest in, so in relation to lawyers. And secondly, probably more importantly, is to ensure that the, that the, uh, that the, that the complaints against attorneys are dealt with both 
effectively and expeditiously. And that's what we hope to monitor, and we are monitoring presently. Well, I was on another television program last week. Oh, I think you were there as well. Uh, and then uh, as a result of that, we have 50 new complaints uh, that came all of a sudden. Mm, I was so say, this sort yeah. of, this sort of uh, engagement may alerts the public to what we can do and what we cannot do. That's what I was saying. Is like it's been two years, but you've only just released your first report because you've obviously been a year, um, you know, compiling and, and, and dealing with complaints. What was available for members of the public who had a, um, a problem before? Would the they just the have public to always had the right to go to the Legal Practice Council, right. the old law societies in the old days. But you must remember that the Legal Practice Council dealt with, it's a regulatory body. It regulates the legal profession. And the bar councils are separate, they regulate the advocates profession. And nowadays that's fallen flat and is all done by the Legal Practice Council. So your first port of call, even today, is a legal, a legal practice council. And if they fail, then you come to us. We monitor them. Our task is to monitor them and to ensure that they deal with their tasks give me effectively. An, give me a good example of the kind of thing that you deal with. Well, the most, uh, well, most of our matters deal with delivery. Where attorneys have been delayed and not uh, dealt with matters either expeditiously or at all. That's the one. The most interesting one we had so far was an attorney who was, uh, he was admitted as, an, as a conveyancer and then sometime after that they told him no you shouldn't have been admitted as an, an a conveyancer because he didn't quite pass the exams. But they had, the, the LPC had in fact supported his admission in court as a conveyancer. So he came to us and we dealt with that because that is a very serious infringement mm. of his rights. You can't have somebody admitted to practice and then the LPC summarily terminates that right. What they should have done was to approach the court to have it set aside if, it's, if it was done in error. Mm. They don't have the right to do so mere remote on their own. Mm. So that was a, a very interesting matter It was dealt with by my staff. The others range with, with disappearance of trust monies, estates that are delayed. Now, we know the problems we have in the master's office where estates take a long time to be resolved and, and that sort of thing. But uh, some delays are inordinate, inordinately long. And in other instances, attorneys just don't do their thing that they're supposed mm. There are time limits. When somebody walks into an office with a will, you're supposed to lodge that immediately with the master and get letters of appointment as executor. Now, some attorneys just don't do that. They're tardy or they don't know the law. And it's an increasing level of ineffectiveness at that level. But it's also operating in an environment that is problematic. You know, uh, the most obvious example is, and I know they're trying to work on this, but load shedding shuts down a court, so there's a delay. Yeah. But we see delay after delay after delay in our courts, even with our high-profile cases. Let me just it's be totally frank. I think load shedding has little to do with dilatory conduct of attorneys. Mm. I suppose it does to some extent, but the uh, fact that your computer doesn't work doesn't mean you but can't. But isn't it also about things not being properly put on the court roll, that the process of organizing the court system also leaves much to be desired? Yeah, the, the, the court system, the uh, Department of Justice has been dealing with that. There are being uh, inverters uh, employed in some of the courts, if not all the courts. Mm. I'm mm. not up to date with what's happening at all the courts. But certainly I saw a will on the part of the Department of Justice to do so. But that's only the question of, 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 of electricity and getting things going. But they also the human factor. And what concerns me is the human factor because the longer you delay with the client's affairs, the more you charge the client. It's more work that's involved. And, and it furthers that reputation, that bad reputation that lawyers have as being sharks just after your money. Um, you know, and that's an yeah. age-old bad reputation that yeah. follows lawyers around, yeah. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But you've spoken about the state capture years. Yes. You've spoken about how so much that was ethical and moral was corroded. Yeah. Um, it seems that maybe we have a problem in the legal fraternity see, as well. The, the problem is not simply that it's eroded. It's now three years later, nothing has been done about it. That's more important. 
that the legal profession has not been able to deal with these instances. If complaints come to us, we will deal with them, firstly. And secondly, we also have the right to deal with matters of our own, on our own accord. We have the right to do And so. you've got teeth, have you? You've got yeah, legal teeth. We've got teeth. some teeth to do so. T tell us what, what sort of consequences see, uh, they can, people the, can the, face. The, the, we, all, we, we are so obliged, firstly, to refer the matter to the LPC because they're the yeah. ultimate regulatory body for the profession. But if they do not do it, act on it, then we can institute proceedings to remedy the situation. But what concerns me the most is the total lack of urgency in dealing with... You see, what is happening is because the lack of urgency, you get the crumbling effect of confidence in the legal profession itself. Now, that concerns me because it impacts upon justice and the acceptability of justice to all South Africans. So we, we need to uphold that tradition. We need to uphold a tradition in which confidence in the judiciary, the legal mechanisms, in lawyers who are a major part of the judiciary is maintained at all times. Uh, we have the image, as you mentioned, of the mercen lawyers being mercenary types. And we, we hear that most of the complaints relate to RAF matters where the lawyers actually steal their, their clients' payments, of desperate clients' payments. And that sort of thing must be, it will never be able to stop it altogether. As long as there's money, there are greedy people around. Yeah, that is, that is unfortunately but, true. Uh, we'll never be able to stop it in its entirety, but we can take steps to get the rotten apples out of the basket. Well, I wish you luck. Uh, Thank you very in your much. work and let's hope you uh, play a pivotal role in doing that. I can do so with your cooperation and with the cooperation of the broader public. Yeah, absolutely, because people have to yeah. come to you and flag these problems so they don't prey on other people. Yes. Absolutely right. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you very much, Mr. Lovely Sally. to chat to you. That, of course, is the Legal Services Ombudsman, Siraj Desai.